Thank you, Father Leo, for that very warm welcome, and uh, thank you all for attending. This is quite a big turnout, very impressive turnout. One of my uh, friends said, are you paying people to come in here? Is that why we have a big turnout? That might explain it, right? Uh, tonight we're going to learn or talk about Catholicism and Islam. And you're saying, what's the relationship between those two faiths? Someone will say, well, the relationship is oil and water. That's the relationship. We can go home already. Well, it's actually a lot more complex than that. And if we look at the relationship between those two major faiths within the last 50 years, we're going to see several improvements, uh, particularly over the last 1,000 years, going back to the Crusades and so on. We're not going to go to the Crusades. We're going to stick within the church in the modern era. That's the name of the topic tonight. So we're going to look at the changes that happened after the Second Vatican Council, which happened between 1962 and 65, and we're going to go all the way up to the Pope Francis era. And then after, I'm happy to have uh, any questions that people might have about some of these concepts. But on the whole, what do people know about Catholicism's relationship with Islam. What do people know right now? Okay, that's good. That's where I come in, right? Very little. So there's, and that's kind of, kind of common. What is the church's official stance on Islam or other religions in general? And that's something we're going to talk about tonight. So this presentation actually came uh, when somebody asked me, they said, do you believe that Muslims are saved, John? And I thought to myself, I said, well, okay, um, that's an interesting question, and I'm kind of surprised that people still have that in their minds, that people who are not part of the church, who are not Catholics, can they be saved? Can they achieve salvation? And when I heard that, I said, we need to do some teaching. We need to do some work on that subject. So that's really where this subject came, uh, uh, came to mind. Some of the topics we're going to be uh, looking at tonight is, can Muslims achieve salvation according to the church? What does the church say about that? Uh, how does the church understand major Islamic teachings? We'll talk about Islam's five pillars, and some of you have heard of that. We'll also look at, what does Islam say about Jesus? What does Islam say about Mary? Particularly in Catholicism, where Mary plays a very large role, what is Mary's role in the Quran? You're saying Mary is in the Quran? I, I thought that was a Christian thing. Well, actually, no, it's, it's quite more than that. And finally, at the end, we're going to talk about some of the relationships that Catholics and Muslim leaders have had over the last 50 years. And we have to be, admit there has been a lot of progress. As you know, the Catholic Church doesn't think, it, and think in years. It thinks in centuries, right? Uh, so it moves very slowly, but still we have to commend the, uh, the, uh, the movement it's done in the past 50 years. So at the top of the, uh, the questions that we have is, what does the church officially say about Islam? When does Islam really get on the radar? We need to go back a little bit, a few years, well not a few, a few decades. We go back to the Second Vatican Council. How many people remember the Second Vatican Council? Okay, good. Yeah, we, we were there. We understood everything, right? Okay, the Second Vatican Council took place in 1962. It was Pope John, uh, now who's a saint, Pope John XXIII, who wanted to open up some doors in the church. He talked about the, the need for what we call aggiornamento, updating. And he uh, started to modernize the Catholic Church. One of the questions that we got uh, at the Second Vatican Council was how does Catholicism deal or understand with other religions? How does it understand with its fellow Christian religions? And how does it understand uh, non-Christian religions, particularly Judaism? And that's where we get to Nostra Aetate. Nostra Aetate means in our time. And this is the church document that deals with the relationship between non-Christian religions. There's a separate document that deals with the other Christian denominations. This one looks at just the non-Christian denominations. Uh, in this case, the major religion that we needed to look at at this time was Judaism. How does Catholicism understand its relationship with Judaism? You have to understand at the time, uh, just before the time of John the 23rd, uh, even in the liturgy, those of you we had Good Friday a few weeks ago, if we were to go back to the 1950s, there would be a prayer for the conversion of the quote-unquote perfidious Jews, a very offensive term that was used in the Catholic liturgy. John the 23rd, when he heard that word, uh, which can mean a lot of different things, said, I want you to say that prayer, but I want you to take that word out. So that was one of the, the changes that John the 23rd made. But when they actually codified a document to deal or to understand with non-Christian religions, that's when we got up to the Second Vatican Council. And in 1965, this was Pope Paul VI, who will be um, uh, canonized very shortly, uh, came, promulgated a document called In Our Time. And 
As I mentioned, the document was supposed to talk about Judaism, but then there were a few uh, Eastern uh, Catholic bishops, Melkite, Babylonian, from the, you know, the Chaldean uh, Melkite traditions, Maronite traditions, who were saying, okay, you're talking about Judaism, which is great, but what about Islam? What about the other great monotheistic religion of the world? What about that other great Abrahamic faith of the world? Why don't we talk about the church's position on that? And the cardinal who was leading this, those of you um, who are familiar with Catholic history will know, was Cardinal Bea, who was the confessor to Pius XII, uh, said, yeah, let's talk about Islam as well. And that's where we get Nostra Aetate. I do have to point out that Nostra Aetate just doesn't talk about Judaism and Islam. It also talks about Hinduism and Buddhism as well. Which is, as somebody said, ooh, that's right, it is very much a, an interesting moment because it seems pretty progressive for the Catholic Church, particularly that 1960s period. So right at the beginning of Nostra Aetate, which is actually, those of you who are interested in short documents will appreciate it because out of the Second Vatican Council, it's a very short document. It's only two pages long. Uh, so people are saying, yeah, I, I already like it already. I have no idea what it's about, but I like it already. Uh, if you know the Vatican do documents, they're quite voluminous. In this case, it's only two pages, but very important pages, actually. And in any case, they discuss Islam in the third paragraph. And they say that we regard Muslims with esteem. Okay, that's a step in the right direction. It notes that Muslims are monotheistic, which is a step in the right, and it's actually a truth. But for the church to admit that, that's great. And they trace their lineage to Abraham. So they go back all the way, like Judaism, like Christianity, to the patriarch Abraham. And that's why we call Islam an Abrahamic faith of the world, because it traces its lineage to the patriarch Abraham. Uh, interestingly enough, it talks a little bit about uh, Islam. It says that they adore one God, just as Christians do. Uh, they believe in a merciful creator of heaven and earth who has spoken to men. They take pains to submit wholeheartedly to his teachings. Uh, and they also acknowledge the fact that Islam reveres and respects both Jesus and Mary. You're saying, Jesus and Mary in the Quran? Does that make any sense? Actually, Jesus is mentioned quite a few times in the Quran, not just once or twice, but many times. Uh, out of all the prophetic figures that are mentioned in the Quran, he's mentioned one of the most. A lot of people don't know that. He's regarded as the pure boy. He's regarded as someone who was as part of the virgin birth that we talk about in Christianity. They believe that he can perform miracles. And they actually add a few more miracles to the tradition as well. They regard him as the Messiah figure as well, and as a prophet, whose revelation was the Gospels that he brought down uh, to teach the world. They also believe that he never married or had children. So those of you the fans of the Da Vinci Code, you're, you're not in line with the, the Quranic understanding of, his, of uh, Jesus, right? But there are a few differences. One of the differences is they do not believe in the divinity of Jesus. Well, most religions of the world do not believe in the divinity of Jesus, right? Outside of Christianity, we understand that. They also do not believe that he was crucified. Uh, they believe that it may appear that he was crucified, but that God brought him to heaven. Okay, that's one of the possible interpretations of, of the crucifixion. But nonetheless, they believe that Jesus will come back. You're saying this kind of sounds like the, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed. He will come back, and he will uh, bring about an age of justice and peace. So there's pretty much a lot of similarity right there, but a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know how much respect Jesus has uh, in the Quran, by Muslims and in the Quran. People don't know that. Uh, it's something to, to keep in mind. I always am amazed when there's always threats to burn a Quran. Uh, several years ago in Dearborn, there's the largest mosque in the United States, the Islamic Center of America. Anybody been there before? And you probably remember the story of when Terry Jones, who was a Christian preacher, wanted to burn a Quran over there. And I was puzzled. He wanted to do it on Good Friday, you know, every other day in Christianity, right? The most solemn day in Christianity. And long story short, uh, I was always puzzled. Why would he want to burn the name of God and Jesus and Mary and all that? It doesn't make any sense to me. But I digress. I want to talk about Mary and the Quran. Mary is very much revered in the Quran, just as, and in fact, a lot of people don't know this, she's regarded as the virgin, just as she is in the New Testament, as she is in the Quran. She's regarded as Mary the pure, Mary the queen of heaven, Mary the queen of saints. You're saying, are you talking about the New Testament? No, I'm talking about the Quran. She's revered very much. And in fact, this might spin a few heads here, but Mary is actually mentioned more in the Quran than she is in the entire New Testament. And that's the whole Bible. A lot of people don't know that point either. That's how revered she is. In Islamic circles, she is the preeminent woman. People don't know that. 
People want to jump to the guns and start demonizing this, that, and the other thing, but they don't understand uh, basic uh, facts of, of what the Quran teaches. And they believe that, uh, just as, as, as Christian, uh, Christians believe, and Catholics as well, uh, that the angel Gabriel announced that she was chosen among women, that you are blessed among women. That kind of sounds like a familiar prayer that somebody might be saying once in a while, right? Uh, that she's blessed among women and that she was going to give birth immaculately to a child, and that child would be named Jesus. And she remained a virgin throughout the rest of her life. So you're saying, well, there's a lot of similarities. I didn't think that, I didn't even know that Jesus was mentioned in there. I didn't even know that Mary was into it too, right? That's something to keep in mind. Now, you're saying, okay, I understand the path. I, I understand, you know, the, the Jesus component, the Mary component. Now my question is, how does the church deal with all the conflict that's happened between Muslims and Christians since the beginning of uh, Islam in the, uh, the seventh century. How does it understand that? Because it has been a very uh, you know, conflict-ridden past between the two religions, historically. The church says it acknowledges this. This is all in Nostra Aetate. It acknowledges the conflict, and it says it's time to forget the past. And let's move on for mutual understanding. That's a very important passage of the, of the paragraph. Yes, there have been some conflictual moments between these two great monotheistic faiths, but now it's time to move on and put that behind us. And that's something that we should keep in mind as we move on into the lecture. Now, criticisms of Nostra Aetate, okay? You always have the good parts, and then they're going to have some criticisms always. And there's a lot of criticisms on this document, particularly within the more conservative elements of the Catholic Church. Uh, one of the big element, uh, conspicuous uh, omissions that we can say is that the church doesn't say anything about Mohammed. How does the church understand Mohammed? Okay, well, you have to understand that the document in itself is two pages long. It can't go into every single point about all of these religions it wants to talk about. It can only do so much. So the church, the church looks at the teachings of Islam. It mentions the pilgrimage. It, men it mentions fasting. It mentions almsgiving and, and intense prayer. Uh, it doesn't go into depth on every single component of the religion. And I understand that Muhammad is a, is a great uh, a component of Islam, is a prophetic figure. But at the end of the day, and Muslims will defend this point better than I could, Muhammad is not God. And that's another point that people need to understand that. And he never claimed that he was God at all. He was a prophetic figure within Islam, the last of the prophets, the seal of the prophets. And that was it. Uh, but that's something that we have to keep in mind. Another point is that the, the, the document, this is more the reactionary element of the church, the document focuses too much on the similarities between those religions. It needs to look at the differences between those two religions. Uh, okay, that's fine as well. But a lot of people don't know the similarities between those two religions. How many people knew that Jesus and Mary were mentioned in the Quran? How many people knew that Mary was mentioned more in the Quran than she is in the New Testament? Okay, very few people knew that. So in this case, you have to understand that we do need to focus quite a bit on the similarities because with those similarities, we can build bridges. And that's the key that we need to be doing, particularly in this world today. These are nice theological documents that we can look at, but eventually they have to be put into practice. Now, uh, another point, we talked about the differences already. The Islamic view doesn't have the Trinity. Islam uh, is very much unitarian in nature. They believe in one God that doesn't have uh, no father and no son. Okay, so there is no such thing as the Trinity. Uh, and that's fine. Most religions don't accept the Trinity of Christianity. I already explained a little bit about the crucifixion and resurrection and how Islam has different opinions on that too. But there are quite a bit of points of, 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 um, of connection between the two. It does, and particularly for the 1960s, when a lot of people didn't hear much about Islam, you know, despite the fact that it was a sizable religion, already in the hundreds of millions, 800 million probably at that time, uh, it does make that initial first step of the church. If we look at the church in the 1960s and we look at the church of the 1950s, we'll see completely opposite uh, views, okay? We'll see one that's very closed and not open to relations with other religions. We'll see one that's very open and uh, engaged with other religions of the world. And that type of tradition that we see in the 1960s is going to continue all the way to today when we get to the modern era, particularly with Pope Francis. Now, I asked one question at the beginning of the class. I said, uh, you know, when that st somebody asked me, they said, John, do you think Muslims are saved? Can they achieve salvation? Well, I believe yes. 
And the church also believes yes, okay? If you're asking me what the church believes, of course, the church believes that. In the church's dogmatic constitution, see, this, this is not a short document. This one's a long one, probably the longest, okay? Right when you heard uh, dogmatic constitution, people already started to shake. In this case, uh, this kind of explains the blueprint for the church's theology on everything. And in this document, it's, it's not a major paragraph, but it is mentioned that Muslims can achieve salvation. Uh, and it clarifies quite clearly, and I'll, I'll show you the exact line here, but the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. In the first place among these, there are the Muslims who, professing to hold the faith of Abraham, along with us, and I put that in bold, adore the one and merciful God who on the last day will judge mankind. This is in Lumen Gentum, uh, paragraph 16. So this is something that's been in church practice since 1964. Let a lot of people don't understand that. They think, you know, they kind of have that old doctrine. Outside the church, there is no salvation, okay? Well, that doctrine doesn't really hold much sway post-Vatican II, as you can see. Now, I want to talk a little bit about modern examples. So from the 1960s, we had all these changes in the church, uh, you know, quite... Uh, seismic changes. They weren't little changes. As those of you remember, the church pre and post Vatican II is significantly different. Now the question becomes, uh, what happened after these documents were promulgated by the Vatican? So after Pope Paul VI signed the documents, Lumum Gentum, Nostra Aetate, what's going to happen next? What did happen next? Well, to be honest with you, nothing really. Okay? And that might be a good thing. So from the 1960s to the 70s, we didn't really hear much about Catholicism and Islam. We really didn't hear much. And even into the 80s, we didn't really hear much at all. Uh, but in the 90s, then we started to hear at least people trying to reach out. And one of them was John Paul II, trying to reach out to Islam. Uh, speaking as a political scientist now, Islam really didn't hit the world scene until what year? Does anybody know? Well, 2001, it really hit the world scene. But even before then, there was something else. Very good, 1979, when you had the Iranian Revolution. That's when a politicized version of Islam hit the world scene, and people started to think about Islam. I'm not saying people didn't think before, but they really started to think about what was going on in Iran? Who was this Ayatollah figure? What was going on? They got rid of the Shah, and now they're doing this, that, and the other thing. What's going on? That's when we really, the West starts to really think about a politicized version of Islam. In reference to the church, and by the way, uh, since we're on the, the topic of this uh, Iranian revolution, the Pope, Pope John Paul II, who is now a saint, did also try to negotiate for the hostages release in, in the uh, 1970s and 80s. Uh, it didn't work, but it, they did try, and he sent one of his uh, archbishops down to Tehran to try to negotiate for that. We don't really hear much until the late 90s, and this is in 1999. Uh, around this time, almost in the month of May we are. And May 14th, uh, John Paul II is hosting a delegation in the Vatican, which is very common. Okay, the, you know, the Vatican is a religious institution, but also it has very significant political connections. And at this time, he's in, um, inviting a delegation from Iraq. And I believe there's a Muslim leader of the Shia sect who comes forward, and he, uh, I will show you the picture, actually, so you can take a look at it. In this case, you have uh, John Paul II. Let me see how this thing works right here, and you have, this is a Shia Imam, and this is the, uh, in this case it was the, the patriarch of the Chaldean church, and he receives a gift from the Imam, and he kisses this gift. This is a Quran, and a lot of people, very in the Muslim world, this was a very proud moment. This was a very respectful moment, and it did a lot to help bridge relationships between Catholicism and Islam. And I'll explain what happened, and then we'll talk about the reaction of, uh, of this, okay? When the Pope did this, the Muslim world was very pleased and very happy. And even a lot of the Catholic and Christian world was also saying this was a great step in the right direction. You're saying, okay, this is great, this is great news, this is great work. But there were elements that rejected this, and still, and actually the people who really talk about this element today are, as I said, amongst the more reactionary Catholics in the church. And they denounced this as apostasy. 
Okay? We've heard that word apostasy post 9-11, and now actually that word was used before 9-11, but was used amongst Catholics going against Catholics. And it was heresy for him to, to, to kiss the, the book of, uh, of, an, of a foreign religion, of a, of a heretical religion and all that kind of language that they like to use. Uh, but uh, people didn't understand a few things at play. First and foremost, in Middle Eastern cultures, whether it's Islamic or non-Islamic, when you receive a gift from someone that you respect and admire, it is customary in some traditions to kiss the gift as a sign of reverence to the presenter of the gift. And that's what John Paul II did. He understood these kinds of subtleties that needed to be kept in mind. Another component was, and as we've expressed quite a bit uh, of the fact, was that the Quran contains the name of God. It contains the name of Jesus and, 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 and the several prophets and Mary. You would revere that document. I'm always admired by our Islamic and Jewish friends who uh, both will actually, if you've ever seen Jewish texts, they'll usually sometimes write G-D. Does anybody know why they do G-D instead of spelling G-O-D, God? Uh, Stephen. Well, it's not only too holy to pronounce, but if I write the word God all over the place on my document and then I shred it and throw it in the garbage, what is it saying about that revered name? It doesn't show that I have much respect for it, right? So this is something that John Paul II, who is now a saint, uh, held a very dear and he showed much respect for. Now, that was just the beginning of Catholicism's uh, relationship or developing a stronger relationship with Islam. And it, you know, how I would say the trajectory is uh, improvement of the relationship would start here. And we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're getting really well. Uh, we're going to hit an apex right now. We're going to hit a top. And then relationships between Catholicism and Islam is going to start to break. Uh, and we'll talk about that break. And some of you might remember that break from uh, a few years ago. Another big step in Catholicism was when the Pope... The first time the office of Pope has been around for 2,000 years, let's say with uh, Peter, all the way to Francis now, the first time that a Pope enters a mosque was in 2001. It took about almost 2,000 years for that, well, in this case, 1,400 years from the history of Islam for that to happen. And the Pope selects an interesting mosque. He selects the Umayyad Mosque. Has anybody been to the Umayyad Mosque in Syria or heard of that? Mosque. The Umayyad Mosque in Syria is actually one of the largest mosques in the country, but it also is believed to be the, uh, the mortal remains of John the Baptist are believed there. It's a nice, beautiful green shrine, and it contains the mortal remains of John the Baptist, believed to be. And he enters this mosque, and keep in mind, John Paul II at this time in his life was not in good physical health. But he still showed respect for his Islam and Muslim friends. He removed his shoes. He had to put some flip-flops on because of his uh, disease, Parkinson's disease. And he entered the mosque. He didn't pray in the mosque, but he just gathered in the mosque. And this was a great, great uh, development in Catholic-Islamic relations. It's never happened before. Muslim leaders have always come to churches before. You saw a couple of years ago, Muslim leaders were at uh, the Vatican and talking to the Pope. And that's very uh, usual, even in the 1960s. Uh, there's examples of Muslim leaders coming to visit Pope Paul VI. The same thing happened later on. Uh, but the first time a pope goes into a mosque was in 2001. And in, in this mosque, the pope does a, 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 you know, one of his charismatic speeches that he was known for, and he talks about forgiveness, that both religions need to ask forgiveness for what they've done, not only for, from each other, but also from God as well. And that's a, it was a major step. There you can see him seated next to uh, an imam of the Umayyad Mosque in Syria. So this is probably as far um, as the relationship would go up to this point. Those of you know that in 2005, John Paul II passed away, and he was succeeded by a different type of pope, uh, Benedict XVI. And we go to a little German town, a university town called Regensburg. Regensburg is where uh, Joseph Ratzinger, who was just recently elected Pope Benedict XVI at the time, gave a speech. And if you know something about Joseph Ratzinger, he was always a professorial figure, kind of the old school professors that you would have known, which you had when you were growing up. And he gave a lecture. And his lecture as a good professor was not the most accessible, okay? It's kind of long, it's dense, 
It has a lot of big words, so a lot of people are kind of already scared off already. But that was Benedict XVI. That was Joseph Ratzinger, how he operated. The title of the lecture really didn't seem that interesting or that contentious. It's called, as I have, Faith, Reason, and the University, Memories and Reflections. So people say, OK, it sounds professorial. It sounds scholarly, pedantic. It doesn't seem that contentious. But it sparked an international controversy, unfortunately. In his lecture, and we can always debate why Pope uh, Benedict did this, but in his lecture, he references a dialogue, a speech between a Byzantine emperor named Manuel II, Paleologos, and his Persian subject. And you say, okay, it happened in 1391, this, this speech, this little dialogue between these two. You're saying, okay, what was the significance of this? Anyways, in this debate, he quotes this emperor. Keep in mind, this is just when Constantinople was going to be, just a few years, about 50, 60 years before, Constantinople was going to be uh, invaded by the Ottoman Empire. So he references this Byzantine emperor, Emmanuel II. There's Cardinal Rat, uh, in this case, Benedict XVI, giving a speech. This looks like the university chancellor over here. And this is Cardinal Sodano, who was the Secretary of State at the time. OK. This is the infamous quote that everybody always wants to talk about. Show me just what Mohammed brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhumane, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. And this was quoted by Benedict XVI in 2006. Now, when this was heard, you're saying, okay, wait a minute. Hold on, let's back up a bit. He goes to Regensburg, which is in Germany. He quotes this speech that was given by an emperor about 600 years plus before. And this is the emperor, by the way, who later became a monk, those of you interested in researching him. A lot of the mainstream media was interested in, in referencing this uh, individual after the fact. But people don't understand the context of this speech. Um, from a PR perspective, I can agree with people that it probably wasn't the best choice to go. It didn't, really have, it didn't really add much to the story. It didn't really add much to his speech. And it caused needless contention. But you have to understand what the Pope was talking about just before he got to that quote. He was actually talking about religion and violence, which was something that was very, and is still a very topical today. Uh, and going back to the 1300s, uh, this is what the Pope says. He, the emperor, addresses his interlocutor, so his person he's debating with, with a startling brusqueness, a brusqueness that we find unacceptable. See, this is something we should keep in mind. He finds it unacceptable on the central question about the relationship between religion and violence in general. So this is something that people didn't really see. All they saw, or all they wanted to hear, and all the media really talked about was right over here. If you look at the rest of the speech, and most people don't look at the rest of the speech, they'll notice that the, the Pope was trying to condemn that kind of language that Emmanuel II was trying to put forward. However, nobody really reads the rest of the speech. All they read is that one little quote, and all hell broke loose. And that's what eventually happened, unfortunately. In this case, there were demonstrations that erupted around the world, protests around the world. There were attacks on churches around the world, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, Muslim leaders were speaking out against the Pope. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, I, when I speak of Muslim leaders, there was one Muslim leader who I thought would have taken this and ran with it. And it was President Ahmadinejad of Iran. How many people remember him? He was always getting himself into trouble one way or another on the international platform for saying a lot of things that I won't get into today. But he actually was the voice of caution this time around uh, amongst his, his Muslim uh, colleagues, which I found quite surprising. Uh, the most unfortunate, and this is very unfortunate, the most unfortunate was an actual death that happened in Somalia. Uh, sister Leonella, she was a, an Italian sister who was a missionary in Somalia, and she was killed as a result of, uh, as of this. So she was shot essentially five days after the speech, and um, she unfortunately succumbed to her wounds. I do have to point out that I believe next month, if I'm not mistaken, Pope Benedict the Sixth, uh, Pope Francis is going to beatif uh, beatify her, and what we say in Latin, in odium fide, which means in hatred of the faith. So if somebody is killed because of their faith, then they could uh, move up to the venerable beatified or saint statuses. But nonetheless, this um, speech 
uh, as, you know, if we think about it, marked a deterioration between Islam and Catholicism. So whether it was Benedict's intention or not, I'm not sure everyone wants to always say, did he know what he was doing? I'll have to say something about Benedict XVI. Uh, he was a great administrator as, a, as, a, as a, a prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. He was a great professor in all of his, and he was an excellent theologian. I've mentioned before that the top theolo theology prize in the world is named after uh, Benedict XVI, Cardinal Ratzinger. But for PR purposes, not the best. And he admitted that. If you read his last testament, uh, it's a, the last book that he published, and he's published quite a bit, he points that out and saying that he might not have been the best administrator uh, for this role as pope. And, and that's another story for another night, but that is something to keep in mind. So what does the Vatican do after this PR uh, disaster? And unfortunately, this would be just be one of the first for, for Benedict XVI. Well, first and foremost, uh, Cardinal Bertoni, who at the time uh, was uh, going to be Secretary of the State or might have been just promoted at that point, he released a statement apologizing on behalf of the Pope. The Pope released a statement also apologizing as well later on that he, if he offended anyone, it was not his intention, uh, and that he was just quoting someone who said something. Uh, that works well for a professor. Professors can quote everybody they want, but when you're a Pope, it's a little bit different, right? Uh, you know, if, I, if I'm teaching a course on the Holocaust I taught last semester, I had to reference some, let's just say, egregious works that I'd rather not have, particularly uh, Mein Kampf, and people know what I'm doing. They know that that's not my thoughts, that was the thoughts of somebody else. But when you become Pope, it becomes a little bit different, because everybody is always watching, and the media is always watching and ready to pull apart every little statement you make. Uh, I do have to point out, and this is a step at least to kind of, uh, you know, a reconciliatory uh, step, in November of 2006, so just a few months after the Regensburg speech, and they've published books on the Regensburg speech if you want to read them. Uh, it's funny, just, you know, one speech of eight pages has uh, unleashed all these books. Um, the Pope does visit a mosque, and you're saying, okay, well, John Paul II also visit a mosque. True, but in this case, it's a little bit different because, as you can see, Benedict is praying inside a mosque. That's something that a pope has never done before. And I have to point out, I was reading an article fairly recently, they said, uh, Benedict XVI surpassed the amount of times uh, of uh, visiting a mosque than all of his predecessors. Well, how many times did he visit a mosque? The answer is two. Uh, John Paul II visited once, so he, so he doubled it, right? So two, right? So when I saw that article, I said, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is uh, the mainstream media at its best, right? Uh, saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, he's doubled the record. Well, what was the record? One, so now he's two. Okay. Uh, but this case, he, he went to the Blue Mosque, uh, that beautiful mosque in Istanbul, and also he went to a mosque in Jordan, which appreciated and respected by the Muslim world, and in this case, he is praying as well. He did get some backlash for this. The, you know, the poor man can never win, right? Uh, well, before he was, you know, why you're Muslim, you're, 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 you said this about Muslims, you quoted this emperor, and then amongst the Catholics, the conservative Catholics are saying, well, now you're praying in a mosque, you're a heretic. Okay, the, the poor man can never win, right? Um, but that was, like I said, a step in the right direction. And uh, as we know, in, in uh, 2013, Pope uh, Benedict resigned and was su uh, succeeded by Pope Francis. Uh, pope Francis is, so far, from what I've seen, his relationship with Islam has improved drastically. Uh, he's gone to a few mosques. A few, uh, he went to Al Azhar uh, University in Cairo, which is the preeminent Islamic uh, university in the Sunni world, at least. Uh, and he's uh, cultivated relationships with uh, Islamic leaders and also with uh, Muslims uh, on the ground level as well. Those of you who remember uh, years ago, well, not so many years ago, but a few years ago, uh, during the Holy Thursday foot washing ceremony, one of the people that, uh, whose feet he washed was a Muslim. And again, there was some back and forth on that too, but again, it was a step in the right direction. Historically, that right was only for 12 males, usually 12 Catholic males, and Pope Francis opened it up not only to women, but also to people who weren't part of the, the Catholic Church. Now, uh, I do want to point out a few things we have to think about now for the future. If you think about demographics, anybody an expert in statistics here? Nobody, okay, no, nobody ever raises their hand to that question. But if you, think, if you think about demographics now, let's talk about numbers. How many Catholics are there in the world? Okay, I'm going to take a shot in the dark. Yeah. Two billion? Uh, lower, but you're, you're on the right track. 1.7. You're, you're getting there. 1.6. <laughs> <laughs> you remind me of 1.5, 1.3, yes? 
<laughs> it's about one and a quarter. Yeah, well maybe, yeah, about one and a quarter is a good number for now, okay? How many, and that's all Catholics, how many Muslims are there in the world? Okay, we're gonna do one and a quarter, one five, one six, one seven, okay. Two and a half billion. No, no it's a little bit high. You're, you're a little bit high now. This, this sounds like the price is right. Yes, sir. <laughs> About 1.8, that's a good number. About 1.8 billion Muslims. Now that, that includes all Muslims, right? So that's both the Sunni, the Shia, Sufi, everybody, right? If you think that we say one point, let's say for the sake of the session, 1.25 and 1.8, okay, that's over three billion people are either Muslim or Catholic. And the world population is about what? Seven. It's about seven, just over seven billion. Okay, so about 40% of the world is one of these two religions. Think of the good that these two religions could do if they started to work together closely. Think of the differences they could make in the spheres around the globe, in their own spheres, society, education, healthcare, poverty reduction, if they work together more closely. And we are starting to do that, I have to say. Uh, I, I, even at Assumption University, we work well with our friends at uh, the Islamic um, uh, a mosque uh, on Dominion there. They send us pamphlets to promote. We promote their events. They promote our events. It works out very well. Think about those little grassroots things that you can do. But as an academic, I'm going to tell you that the, the hindrance to developing relations between these two groups is ignorance, is old-fashioned ignorance. Who People who choose to ignore the similarities and the good things that exist between those two religions. They fixate on certain minuscule aspects that have happened centuries before these two religions. And what do they get you? Hatred, resentment, violence. And what does that accomplish? Nothing. And if we think, and as Nostra Aetate teaches, and as Islam teaches, and as everyone of all these religions teach that we're all children of God, then we do need to cultivate good relations between each other. That we come from one creator, and that's what we talk about in Catholicism, then we need to ensure that we're all working together and acting like brothers and sisters. So on that point, I like to end, uh, but I do want to thank our friends at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, uh, Father Mike, where's Father Mike? He's hiding in the front, for having us. Uh, here we have a large church. I'm very impressed with that. I, I think we should have charged. Maybe that would have been a good thing. But anyways, um, so I thank you all for coming out tonight. And